Welcome to this week's episode of Beer and Bites, hosted by Chris Jordan and Jeremy Murdershaw. And this week's guest, we have Peter West of West Networks and Tim Swayze, who is the new sales manager for West Networks. With that, uh, gentlemen, if you would like to go ahead and start with your questions. Well, first, let's do an intro. So, uh, Pete, you want to talk a little bit about yourself and, and West Networks? I don't do really good talking about myself. Uh, that's Actually, what Tim's Tim, for. Tim, could you talk <laughs> about <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I'm a SD-WAN architect, um, really focusing in the enterprise marketplace. Um, got into it a couple years ago with a challenge to build a data center for under $25,000. Um, it was uh, 2008 when the, the economy was crashing. And I used to do Cisco and Juniper, uh, bigger networks. And um, I had this nice big $250,000 budget to build out an, an architecture to bring in a lot of data for um, back monitoring, believe it or not, um, and for wind farms. And the economy kind of tanked and they said, oh, you, you, you don't have $250,000 anymore, you have $25,000. Um, and so I had to build this network that I built, got budgeted and rebuild it um, and a smaller with a much smaller budget. Started looking around and I found these Peplink routers and I said, can this handle multiple terabytes a month of data and reliably stay, stay running? And the guy goes, oh yeah, this is this stuff's amazing. And so, and I kind of used it a little bit in the past, but not, not on a business level. And um, so I, I bought, so this router it cost me uh, $1,900. It was a multi-WAN load balancing router. So they claimed would be able to support multiple terabytes a month lots of daily which is a lot of daily traffic mm -hmm. um and so i was able to build, buy two of these in high availability redundancy for four thousand for four thousand dollars um and so we we did that we plugged in our fiber lines coming in um then i i bought some uh some non-name brand servers and built out a, a server farm but ignoring the the servers the the ability to transition from a two hundred thousand dollar wan environment to a $4,000 WAN environment impressed me greatly. That server environment, that router was brought down last year. Um, it was decommissioned. So from 2018 eight, to 2018, that network did its job uh, it, for $4,000. It, it, it blew my mind. Um, and it, it challenged me to really consider how I operate on, a, on an inter enterprise level doing data center builds. Um, and since then, I've become a Peplink evangelist. Uh, I actually have a peplink.com email address and evangelist at peplink.com. And <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's really changed how I look at networks and what is really possible utilizing SD-WAN. And it's evolved so much since 2008. I mean, we're doing multiple gigabits of, of, of bonding with, with cellular integration now and 5G coming out. Um, our company was the very first company ever to do live mobile DICOM radiology images over cellular um, as successfully. And so uh, we did that in 2011 with LSU Health and uh, now growing into enterprise marketplace. So, uh, you know, in a very short uh, uh, synopsis, that's what, that's what I do. Okay. So let's, let's take it back. Yeah, let's back up this. for a second. <laughs> You got to enter the well, beer? I think we should. Yeah. Well, you see if I can get into <laughs> Here you go. Yeah, shoot right in front of me, right? It's yeah, the. Uh, I just learned that from Al. Yeah. The Offshoot Beer Company. It's the Retreat Hazy Double IPA, and it's absolutely fantastic. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna double your IPA with another Hazy Double IPA from Creative Arts. It's uh, Life in the Clouds. They, all the cans kind of have a different piece of art on it. I think that's maybe their stick. Um, nice. It's fairly solid. It's fairly solid. It's definitely a hate lighter hazy one. Um, it comes in these little small pint ones, uh, but we'll live with those. It's not like the big 48 ounce or ones that we kind of need. Um, and then, Al, you actually brought a non Bud Light. I did. And I got, I got a nice Texas uh, one going here today that. Uh, says chief justice right so we're we're game solid <laughs> solid solid i'm glad i'm glad we get we're getting the quality up in here now now tim and pete unfortunately are in this fasting competition it's yeah 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 
Nice. Vodka. Not even Tito. Sorry. Say you can't see that he's got Tito's in there, but you know. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> kettle one, kettle one. Protein. <laughs> <laughs> So, so let's uh, let's back up for a second. Yeah, you started. You jumped right into SD WAN. Well, you didn't jump into SD WAN. That's the part that I was. You jumped into load balancing routers. You used PepLink, but I think we gotta listen. To you gotta the talk about. We really it. want on board is is that yeah. is this SD WAN? Yeah. All right, Jeremy, go on, man. So for the uninitiated, what is SD WAN? Let's start there. It's it's really kind of funny because the, the answer to that is um, it really is what qualifies as SD WAN. But SD WAN by definition is software defined WAN, um, and so the idea is you're using software to control your WAN architecture. Um, and so and that started out back in the the old days is really the ability to um, what some people might have called um, traffic shaping. Uh, was, was sort of a, a common term in the in the past um, related to, to to what is now commonly SD WAN, but I actually, uh, if I could find it, I, I have a really cool infographic that I posted on LinkedIn probably about a year ago, like kind of saying what what I believe is SD WAN, and and I think it has several little components. One, it needs to have it, oh, an SD WAN router needs to be able to manage more than one internet connection. Um, so a, a good standard network would have, especially a redundant network, would have like a, a, a internet line coming into a router and then you might have some sort of peering and then an internet line coming another router and if this router fails it rolls over to this router and you have this other internet connection and they're not working together they're working as separate internet connections for redundancy failover maybe btp peering that kind of thing um sd wan brought the concept that you're you have multiple internet connections that are being used at the same time it's not failover it's not redundancy it's live usage of more than one internet connection and um, several years ago, let's say go back to 2008 to 2012 at time frame, the idea or the concept was you could have redundant load balanced incoming connections and redundant yeah. load balanced outgoing connections. So you're, you're, you're able to utilize two cable modems or two fiber lines at the exact same time for incoming and outgoing traffic. Yeah, one um, thing I liked about PepLink, you know, Pete, was is that I saw that the G4, G5 capabilities, right, when nobody had it, right? Now yeah. you've got, like, Meraki magically all of a sudden has a, a, a cell data capability, but they never had it before, right? Correct. And so they're officially kind of beginning an SD, coming to SD-WAN. Um, so before you go too far, let's talk about that, is what do you think about these other ones like the, the Cisco, right, or the Fortinet, um, because their price points are being used close to an SD WAN. Yeah, Jeremy. Well, I was gonna say there's. I think there's two. But to take that a step further, how do you differentiate PepLink against the firewall vendors who offer SD WAN, and then your purpose built SD WAN devices like all the V's. And Silver Peak, and, yeah. and so on. Well, you know, those guys are all coming in kind of late in the game, uh, highly venture capital funded, um, and they make a great product. I mean, the stuff I've seen with Silver Peak and whatnot, it's really neat. Um, where Peplink differentiates ourselves are in kind of three three categories. If I can do it quick, and there might be four, but three categories I can think of. One, we're the first to offer integrated cellular. Um, our, our products have been doing cellular integration since 2011. Um, and so you, we, we have a, a huge understanding of, of the cellular marketplace when it comes to SD-WAN. Um, and so that's, there's a lot of experience that comes into how to tweak cellular, how to monitor latency and how to bond cellular connections as they associate themselves to latency. So we have, we have the three, three aspects of PepLink that really, really differentiate ourselves from the competition. And one of them is the fact that we have a long history of cellular integration. We're one of the, we're one of the first SD-WAN providers or the first SD-WAN provider to provide cellular as, as native to the router. What that means is a router isn't having a WAN connection going into some other cellular device where it doesn't know the signal strength, the packet loss, the what's happening on that cellular, that cellular network. The router knows what tower it's connected to and what carrier it's connected to and how to, how that performs. Um, the other thing that Peplink that differentiates Peplink from most of our competitors, um, and I know there's new products coming out on a daily basis. That's why I want to say most is our bonding technology. 
the ability to act to truly aggregate multiple internet connections that are diverse is, is something peplink is super proud of we call it speed fusion and and you can aggregate or bond multiple internet connections either it be cellular wi-fi satellite ethernet fiber to make one ultra reliable high speed network um and so and that's what that's what differentiates it whenever i'm doing a competition against another another carrier another router i demonstrate speed fusion and they go oh my gosh that's amazing and it really is it really is amazing so you can what? drop you can drop multiple sims in, in one of your endpoints oh yeah going one of your yeah I, I have mobile mammography right now with 18 bonded cell sim cards providing wow. almost 500 megs of remote bandwidth now granted most people are going to listen to us or are going to be in the us but i take it that those sim cards can be international international we work globally um uh, i had a, a very famous or popular well-known i should say this best word well-known uh um, I'm trying to maintain confidentiality. A well-known uh, uh, news Wait, agency this, that, <laughs> yeah, well-known news agency that, that had to do that was doing um, uh, coverage of the uh, Olympics over in Korea. I do apologize. So someone over in Asia last, the last one that was over in Asia somewhere, and so they took their router. They needed the US IP address. So they actually bonded back using a fusion hub. Um, over the, the Great Wall of China to to our to USIP to access their servers, um, and so it allowed them to travel from a from the US over to to, to Asia and not yeah, have to right. worry about yeah. firewalls and VPNs and connectivity and bonding those SIM cards together. So they've got multiple carriers out there, so they could roam around without having any issues associated to their connectivity. So so not only can we bond multiple carriers, but we can bond multiple carriers, allowing people to go any of the anywhere in the world. Uh, we're actually very popular among uh, the yacht industry because of that. We bring up the yacht, but we, you know, obviously, one issue with the yachts is is distance from land. And we'll, yeah, we can have a we can have a yacht party one day. And talk to <laughs> um, I would presume you could use satellite, though, right? You, you well, that's what's so neat is at, when you're close to land, you're actually on Wi-Fi. Then you kind of spread away from the Wi-Fi range. You switch over to bonded cellular, and up you know 30, 40 miles, you could be on cellular with good antennas. And then once you get 30, 40 miles off, out of, off, away from land, you switch over to satellite, you're in satellite. And then as you approach the next body of land, you connect to cellular, you get to the, the yacht and you connect to, or the, to not to the yacht, you get to the, the dock or the, you know, where the yacht parks right. and then you can connect to Wi-Fi again. Yeah. And that's a lot like with the navigational software for, for yeah. and everything like that is there's just the coastal navigation versus the open water navigation. Exactly. Um, Anyway, so you brought the word mobile. So this is, I think, the really one reason why I really wanted to get you on now and 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 really have a conversation. Obviously, you're talking about mobile clinics, right? So that's one of yep. your customers too, isn't it? But it's our largest vertical, correct? Okay. So so in these mobile clinics, uh, how much can you tell me about the infrastructure? I mean, what what does? I mean, most of these people who are going to listen to us are used to to regular facility stuff, right? Yeah. So now you're going to jump and you're going to put a, you're going to have a mobile clinic and you're going to have this Peplink router, Peplink switch, whatever you want to call it in this thing. What is the architectural difference, right? Electronic wise. Talk a little bit about the physical difference. Does your 3D printer, I know you got a 3D printer. Does the 3D printer jump in these mobile clinic universe at all, or is that a different project? It plugs into the mobile uh, mobile pop pop up location. We actually, sell most of our three D printed stuff to the military um, for mobile cases. Um, so what we're doing with the three D printing is basically taking these mobile routers and putting them into smaller confined cases that are that make them more mobile than a, a, a mobile health clinic okay. that might be on wheels. So the idea is um, having a mobile kit that allows you to pop up and deploy instantaneously anywhere. And okay. so that's a lot, a lot of the 3D printing that we do is associated to mobilizing our mobile routers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, of course. So, so I, we'll go back to the- Building we'll like a ruggedized chassis. Yeah, exactly, yeah, building a ruggedized chassis, but long battery life. So you have 20, 40 hours of battery life. Um, so you can set up a, a, an emergency response center, um, pop this thing out and you're not worrying about it. It's running good, well. Um, hot swappable batteries, they stay operational. You can take out a battery, put in a new battery, and then it stays running. So, you know, the idea is configurable and, and mobile and 
powerful. Yeah, so I, are those environmentals, you worry about those when you're, you're dealing with a clinic? I mean, as far as like- I don't worry about like that with the clinics. And, yeah, I don't, um, you know, all of our stuff is high temperature, high gains, uh, high temperature and, and uh, industrial strength. So we're not worried about temperature ranges as much. Um, uh, what we're worried about is getting power to them, right? Making sure they're on because people need that internet to be connected for the other systems to work. Um, mm -hmm. And so we try to make sure that the way that we build it out, whether it's in a mobile clinic on wheels or, you know, with ignition sense and timers to shut off the battery so we don't kill the battery system or enabling POE to power their phones and their equipment. So, you know, making sure that it works uh, for that, that particular customer need. So, so one of the things that intrigues me is this, this thought process, especially now, right? And where I'm at in Texas, we've got these storms and these, and we're close to what's known as Tornado Alley, right? Yeah, I was going to ask you, Pete, if you could find me another sales guy in case I lose Al towards you know, <laughs> This is really coming up a lot lately, this Tornado crap. So, but I could imagine, right, uh, one of these small rural communities that gets hit hard by a tornado, right? And yeah. get, a lot of their infrastructure is taken out. They have no power. They have no internet. They have no, no cell tower. And you bring in one of these mobile clinics to help the injured. But at the same time, you can provide emergency services through that mobile clinic kind of as a hotspot for the emergency personnel, right? Yes. And that is actually um, in some of the current situations that are going on right now, a lot of my customers are calling me and saying, hey, we, we're, we're kind of repurposing our mobile clinic to provide services. And they're actually driving out to areas and providing cellular Wi-Fi so that people that can't get internet right now or are having problems communicating are using these hotspot clinics as a big hotspot <laughs> router in a sense. I didn't even think about that. Uh, yeah. And so, um, so they're using these clinics to provide Wi-Fi and internet to uh, the community and to the clinicians and the doctors that might be out in the field under a tent. See, I was going to go down the first responder route. So, so yeah. obviously, is there anything special about first responders? I know there's a bunch of laws and a bunch of stuff around first responders. Do you have different technology for first responders? We don't. It's the same technology. Yeah. Um, we, we do have some extra licenses that can be purchased at one time fee to make them FIPS compliant for some of the the you know the encryption levels, but but otherwise, yeah, otherwise um, it's the same equipment. Uh, it's just maybe a little bit more secure. Um, so when we're doing first responder stuff, we're locking down the routers. We're we're making sure that they go directly to their their um, you know their their system, and then goes kind of. So it's a little bit different the way we set them up, and they're they're usually very very restricted. Whereas in a mobile medical, you've got doctors and clinics, and you have like maybe a public Wi-Fi where it's routing out to the cellular, and then, so you know we might configure it a slightly differently. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of my mobile clinics have a much broader use of internet, uh, whereas the first responders, they might have one or two SIM cards um, because they have a very little data need. My mobile clinics have up to 18 SIM cards providing, like I said, up to 500 megs. It's literally an ISP on wheels. Yeah. So, so I, I know Jeremy's got a question after this, but one of the things I wanted to ask about, Peter, was this, this notion that uh, Peplink provides GPS location kind of software feeds so that you literally can take feeds back and track where that mobile clinic is at any point in time. Yes. Uh, so all um, using our cloud management software, we not only can manage the configuration, security policies, um, all of our SIM cards, you also have a map that allows you to see your entire fleet. Um, it lets you know where, all they, where the routers are at all times, where your fleet is. Um, you can go back and say yesterday at 3 p.m., what was my cell coverage? What would it as heat maps, so travel, mobile heat maps using GPS and cell data to combine that and to create a heat map of your cellular coverage in a particular area. It also will allow you to see what speed a vehicle was driving. So, you know, if you need to know how fast a unit was or geolocate, um, a lot of my mobile clinics are, I mean, these are multi-million dollar clinics with expensive radiology equipment in them. So they say, hey, at six o'clock at night, lock this thing down. If it leaves a 500 feet radius of, of this building, from 6, 6 p.m. to 7 a.m., send an alert to the security staff. And so we send a text message alert to the security staff, to let them know that the vehicle has moved outside of its approved area. Wow. Um, and so a lot of our vehicles, if they leave the city or, the, you know, or some region around the city, it says, hey, warning, you know, let, let someone know. Or if it exceeds the approved speed limit, um, you know, if it goes over 75 miles an hour, send an alert to the supervisor. Um, all that's built into our technology. Yeah, I know that Al 
in, in, in the rest group influence is really interested because we want to be able to do things like oh well if if the van is in chicago the people should be in chicago <laughs> right and so we're looking at doing correlation rules saying you know the being able to associate the movement of the router with the movement of the people's access so it can be sure that they're still, still in the same location so it's kind of an interesting thing that you know you know you think about this this iot world you know, and basically that that sd wan is is a member of that iot world it's an own little entity that we used to ignore right yeah um, it's a fairly fascinating piece of equipment uh so anyway so, so you go down this, this stuff so what are some of the before we get into the security aspects, so what are some of the obstacles that you run into with mobile deployments? So obviously, listen, I can't imagine you putting a bid in, you, you deploying it, and everything goes off perfectly and you make a bunch of money, right? What? No. <laughs> that, that mentally happens in your head when you put the bid in, but, but, but what, is, so what are the obstacles that come into play in an SD-WAN world? Well, it's funny because it's not the SD WAN world that's an issue. It's um, it's the mobile world that's an issue. Um, so when I'm talking about SD WAN and I'm going into like a standard uh, enterprise deployment with uh, with uh, where they're expecting the other guys that we've mentioned, like the other competitors, and they're trying to com compare services. It, most IT guys are are okay with that. If you talk about connecting two fiber lines and you know replacing or augmenting your MPLS, it, 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 they they get that. When you go into the mobile world, there's no there's no playbook. Uh, you know, you're kind of like, okay, well, do I go on a hotspot or I buy a laptop with a built-in SIM card or we just put up iPads and you know, and, and so there's no playbook for security. There's no playbook for for how this works. And you know, and so everybody's kind of trying to to invent this solution. And so when you you go, I can make this like an MPLS network. They go, wait, what? No, no you can't. Like. That's it. No, everybody tells me this can't happen. And so trying to convince them that what they've been told is impossible is possible is actually the hardest thing to do. Um, one of my best clients, actually, who is currently my best client, um, when they, I would, I sent them a, my, my, my brochure, my kind of my spec sheet PDF. And they were, they literally had a joke term page 18 because I, I kept referring to page 18. This is my, my design. And, and so when I went up to do the proof of concept with them, I said, did you guys look, you know, we're going to set this up like page 18. And literally the whole room started laughing at me. And, and so I, I was like, obviously I, it wasn't being understood. So I, I turned to the white paper and I drew a picture of their bus on the white paper. And I said, okay, you got the white paper and you, you've got the bus and you're going to add some SIM cards and we're going to make this thing. And I drew the network out and they go, oh, that makes perfect sense. And I said, can you flip to page 18? And I drew the same thing, but it, it's not easy to understand how that traffic flows because it's not normal VPN. It's not normal routing. It, it doesn't act the same way. And so it, it's once you explain it to anybody that understands routing and security, they get it, but it's getting that, that, that concepts to be redefined. So they understand the, the, the new way to do it. Um, so that's the first obstacle. And the second obstacle is the security team. Convincing them that that we that we know what we're doing and we're not gonna we're not gonna. That's because you don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, so so Jeremy from so, a from a, yeah. a an MSSP perspective in this SD WAN, uh, how do you see that playing? You, you, I mean, do you have? I would imagine you have clients who have mobile clinics or mobile buses. Maybe go do big marketing events or. Back right. in the day before COVID, right, they would go do all kinds of conferences and stuff and might have uh, setups there that they would need to have access to that way. Yeah, you know, conferences are, are interesting, right, because, uh, you know, you, you're, you're paying somebody a premium for internet bandwidth, right, in your booth. Um, the idea of using a cellular-enabled SD-WAN device makes conferences much less expensive, right? Um, having to pay the you know Las Vegas Hilton right for you know Arson. one <laughs> one meg of one meg of internet for ten thousand dollars is ridiculous when you can get you know a pep link with three or four air cards right or we, uh, sim cards in it. We hosted the entire uh, Gibson 2017 uh, CES event on an HD four with four sim cards, doing about four hundred megs of throughput, 
Fox News was broadcasting live. We had YouTube 360 broadcasting live. Over 3,000 guests into the event um, using our Wi-Fi. Um, and, and just like that, and saved the company thousands and thousands. I mean, the ROI was like one day. <laughs> one day. Yeah. Half a day. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to open up some, some festive ale, which I got a great price. Ox Brewery got a great price because they canceled the Cherry Blossom Parade around here in D.C. So, uh, so instead of a $14 four-pack, it's a $9 four-pack. It is a lot of extra alcohol. Thing, yeah, it's, it's, it's painful because like you up to like the Red Sox and they had the blueberry ale up there. Yeah. I'm not a huge put fruit lambic kind of thing into my beer, but for a 20% discount, I'll, I'll, I'll handle it. I'll be good. So, <laughs> so Peter, <laughs> so to get, go ahead, Jeremy. I was thinking to get back to answering your question now from an MSSP's perspective, uh, the you know, you say you have cloud management tools for your, for the PepLink devices. Are they multi-tenant? They are. Have that uh, so as an MSSP, it, it is multi-tenant. I manage a lot of clients um, in, in our cloud platform. Okay. Yeah. You are, what is your uh, what is the state of 5G within your devices? Uh, I'm not officially allowed to say that. Uh, so, but but we are 5G ready. Uh, so yeah, I think it's the best way to say it in the United yeah. States. It's 5G yeah. ready. Okay. I mean, they're 5G, but so so we've released an entire or... line. Yeah, we we've released an entire line of products that end in the in the letter X. So we have the SDX, the EPX, the MBX. Um, they're all 5G capable based on the specifications required, um, meaning that they all support more than one gig of routing throughput, um, and they're all modular. So that what that means is that as the 5G technologies evolve and change, um, or if you're going to choose millimeter wave versus sub six, you just install the modem that you need. And the router does okay. that, the rest for you. So if you're going to be on a mobile vehicle or in a venue um, and you're going to be using 5G sub six, you're trying to get that broad, that broad range of, of easy mobility, uh, you can install that modem. If you're going to be uh, at a fixed facility or going to be using a CPE, you can put a 5G millimeter wave antenna, a router modem in the router and have that, that, that really high speed millimeter wave throughput that's available. Um, and, and so, yeah, the idea is being ready for the challenge that appropriates, keeping that whole Peplink ecosystem alive where we're the, kind of the first guys doing it. Yeah, I think, Jeremy, one of the reasons So SD-WAN is, yeah. SD -WAN is like uh, allowing organizations who have the traditional telco circuits, the expensive MPLS stuff, right, to, to move over into using lesser expensive uh, internet circuits, right? So the question is, using the PepLink cellular technology, is that even more cost effective for an enterprise to have these cellular clusters at their, at, at their building edges instead of going even with cable modems or, or you know, e Metro Ethernet? I hate blanket statements uh, just because I'm, you know, I, don't ever wanna, I never wanna be like, you know, wrong. Um, Ethernet or like a cable modem is almost always going to be better than a cellular. Where the cellular comes into play on the on the um, enterprise world is the last mile or the the, the 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 unreachable. So, for example, a lot of times our enterprise customers are using us for zero day deployment. Hey, I've got a new facility. We're spinning a branch that we're setting about out in Chicago or Illinois or what somewhere, and we're going to deploy an SDX router with three cell cards built into the router because it's modular. They plug that in, then they order the fiber circuit or the cable modem. And so they're not waiting 90 days or 100 days for a build to come out. Um, I have a customer that um, in Seattle, Washington, I mean, well lit facility area um, that wanted to deploy uh, one of their branch locations in October of last year. They thought, oh, well, we'll get the, the cellular. So you have an SDX with some internet connectivity. They lit it up. They thought there would be 90 days before they got um, the new circuits. Well, there were some complications getting the permits to dig the circuits under the, they've been down. There's no circuits today uh, as of the recording of this video um, in that facility right now. And so they've been running since October of last year to now on cellular because the circuits never got installed. Um, a Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, uh, they had a, a youth and family facility have a fiber cut. I overnighted an HD4 router they lit up the site by 8.30 a.m. the next morning. So they had 30 minutes of, of site downtime. 
Um, we lit them up uh, a year and a half ago. The fiber got fixed. They plugged in the, the fiber, but you know, MPLS, it's usually like five, 10 mags. You know, they buy those little cheap MPLS circuits. Um, the, everybody complained that the network got so slow. So they ended up having to unplug it and switching back to cellular because the cellular was providing them more throughput. Um, so at these branch locations, it is possible. So to, to answer your question, it is possible to have pure cellular because maybe it is. But but I always tell people that when you trust your voice and video applications, you know, that reliable cable Internet, it's going to be more stable than a cellular connection. But those cellular connections, when you're bonding them, does create a reliable architecture that can augment or kind of replace that if it's not available. Yeah, uh, you know, could you not have added the MPLS circuit at Parkland, for example, to the the, the SD WAN configuration? And That's actually what we ended up doing okay. later. Yeah, yeah. So, so we they unplugged it, and then I was like, "Hey, no, no, plug, plug it in." And I'll, I configured it to bond them all together for reliability okay. and speed. So that makes sense. You know, Jeremy, yeah. Okay. Computers. Uh, listen, I mean, let's just talk about reality for a second, right? Because I mean, I hate to say it, our industry is based upon hypothesis, right? Our security industry. I don't know what the <laughs> SDA industry is based upon, but you know, there's been a race. What, what your job is, and we had this discussion before. And Jeremy always rolls my eyes every time I think operations is more important than security. As a security guy, I, I say it all the time because. You just brought it up. Like, what good is a network if the network is not up, right? So, so obviously, Peplink's done a great job of establishing a network. And their their race to the security platform capability is amazing, right? We just we we started working with you back in January, and already they made temporary firmware changes, and now they're making permanent fir firmware changes to allow us to have better vision across the SD WAN network, right? I mean, it's crazy what they're capable of doing. Um, and you get Cisco on the other hand, who just released their very first cell. Okay, so everybody knows they should buy a first generation everything, right? <laughs> just first generation cell capability uh, in their Meraki's. Um, and, and, and granted, it must be better because it's four times more expensive. It's my point, I guess I'm trying to make is so you see this race, you see this, you would be agnostic if agnostic made. How could I say it? You'd be agnostic if if you were to, to recommend different things. But right now, Peplink has such a big lead, right, on operational capability, right, that it doesn't make sense. And I'm saying right all the time. I hate when I say that. It doesn't make sense when to say I'm going to just bid it out for whoever has the best name. I mean, Peplink's not a huge name, but when it comes down to the SD WAN, and I don't, I don't even like to call it SD WAN. Let's, let's just mobile network capability. They're far ahead, right? And then the other aspect is, is I have a regular network, but yet if I can drop a SIM card, I have a high availability network all of a sudden, right? And I'm sure you can say, send it over the regular wire until I really need you to send it over for, for over cell data. So, Most definitely. So when you see this race occurring, and you're dealing with customers day by day. Obviously, operations is most, every general I've ever worked with will tell me, does it support the operation, right? That's the first question, right? So obviously, Peplink supports the operation today, right? And West Network has the intelligence, and that's another conversation we really need to have, right? Which is that intelligence plays a huge role in the ability of implementation, right? It has the intelligence of deploying this capability I mean, right now, do you see the catch up of Cisco and other devices, Fortinet, really closing the gap, or is operation that much stronger? I mean, how do you look at this play when you deal with an end customer as opposed to the magical world of security people who believe you're going to listen to us? Um, a lot of times I think of the, that, the, the, this term that's used sometimes called industry standard. You know, say, oh, well, they're the industry standard, right? But it's not best practice, it's industry standard. Because okay. best practice is a documented practice outlined by, by a vendor that this is how that should be implemented, right? So you have a best practice that, you know, you might have a security best practice on, on implementing firewall policies for least access. Okay. Industry standard is this vague term that, that doesn't really have any meaning. It, it's, well, it's the industry standard way to do it. Well, who's industry standard? Like, who defined this standard? Where, what is, 
what is this standard from? And, and I hear people say that a lot. Well, Cisco's the, the industry standard. And therefore, it's, but why? Well, well, they, 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 well, it's the industry standard. It's, it's, it's what you do. It's, they can charge more money. Why? So they must why? Be you know? And How many people get fired buying Cisco? Right. right. I think that's, and that's, that's, what and that's the answer is standard. how many people get fired. By, I've heard that statement too. And you know, you buy you Cisco and you don't. <laughs> you know somebody who got fired and they use Cisco. So don't yeah. worry about it. It just um, happens. It's just not. Yeah. And so that, but that's the term that's used a lot in my world. And, and so when we talk about SD-WAN or implementing PEPLINK, um, it, it's knowing the, the, you mentioned it earlier too, is about the intelligence, the, the, the ability to architect a solution. And that, that's where I come into play. It's, it's showing people there is a different way. And that different way can not only save them, one of my customers, $56 million, but you can also improve performance and reduce reliance on, on these contracts, right? That's what all these customers want to do. They want to get you in, these companies want to get you in contracts so they can, you know, take that, take your data uh, services, for example, you know, the ISPs, they want, they want, they're offering SD-WAN now so they can maintain those relationships and those contracts or uh, Cisco can maintain SmartNet and, and sell you on their services. Peplink frees companies from that. They free them from dependence on an ISP and de dependence on a, on an, on a, on a particular contract per se. And so they can, they can have that, that, that the, the ability to build their infrastructure out the way they want it built. And I've had customers build some epic networks utilizing things that even are against my best practice and they work phenomenal. Uh, and and it's, it's really neat to see how creative people get with that as well. So, so, so right here, let, me, let, me, let me ponder this one for a second because I think it's, it's, it's a good direction to go down to. And, and you talk about like intelligence of people and years ago, I, mean, I used to work with a great staff at the FAA, Jerry Hancock and, there's there some great people I work with back there. And what we found was a, is a WAN network, right? That every engineer we talked to saw it as a LAN network. Their, their, their intelligence was this, I run it on my home network and this is how everything should work, right? And, and then they extend it and they say, the whole internet works like my house, right? And, and, and it, it really taught me that the WAN technology, right? Not SD-WAN, just WAN technology was significantly different. When it came down to engineering and security. And then all of a sudden, what I've learned dealing with you guys, right? Is SD-WAN is like the redheaded stepchild. It's like what host-based security used to be for Jeremy and I. It's the redheaded stepchild, it, it had no love. And yet now COVID-19 is making everybody work from home, <laughs> right? And all of a sudden now we have the nasty double Ds. And what I mean by the nasty double Ds is diversity of equipment and distribution of equipment. The, the, in other words, it's spread all over the place, right? And nothing is the same, right? And you've got to come in, and I, I thank you for solving everybody's problems, Peter. You've got to come in and make that network work, right? Yeah. So, so that's kind of what you're dealing with. So lessons learned from you, when you deal with guys and, and you sit around a table and you present it, and I mean guys in general, people, is what are the barriers? You brought up one, which is you can't do what you're doing. You can't connect all these different people. I mean, what are, what are the barriers that people deal with with, with mobile and SD-WAN? And, I mean, what's your bread and butter when you, when you go into a place and people just go, man, I, I'm blown away. I didn't think we could do that. I mean, what is, what is it? The bandwidth? Is it the ease of use? Is it the tracking of people? Is it the vision into the network? What yes. <laughs> so, so, so we, we talk about those three things and we got, we got sidetracked on mobility, but yeah. the last thing is that ecosystem. Yeah. And, and so when you talk about the Peplink ecosystem, uh, Jer Jer Jeremy, have you played with Peplink at all? Awesome. Unfortunately I bet you, not. I, need, I bet you in 10 you're gonna minutes. You're going to send me some after this, right? right? I am. I bet you in 10 <laughs> minutes, I could make you a Peplink guy. It, it's, and, it's a and, different, Jeremy. And, and the reason is because of the ecosystem. It's not complicated. It's straightforward. It reads like a book. Peplink unifies the architecture so that your switches and your routers and your access points and your mobile connectivity and your cellular SIM cards, it all feeds back into InControl 
and allows an IT guy or a security guy to see all the event logs and all the clients and all the SSIDs and all everything that you're trying to look at that's all dispersed and mobile and moving, literally moving, in one place. Um, and one of the biggest pet peeves I have to the word SD-WAN actually right now is people are literally treating it as a WAN. So they're saying, oh, by the way, you're going to buy this SD-WAN product, and then it's going to sit in front of your existing network. So now IT has, they, they basically just bought a third ISP. They have this guy that's sitting here in front of their, you have your ISP, your cellular provider, your Ethernet, your fiber, your MPLS, you have the SD-WAN vendor, and then you have all your equipment, your security equipment, or your network. And so you've added this layer. I had a guy just today, I was on the phone with troubleshooting a port forwarding. And what he realized is he had the public IP, but it was being fed from a, a, an SD-WAN provider that wasn't Peplink. And he didn't even know where the IP was or how to bring it into his firewall. And so you add extra layers that aren't really increasing your network, your, 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 your control of your infrastructure or your reliability because you don't even know what's happening. It's like this magic black box. And so with Peplink, it's, I really don't like the word SD-WAN either. You mentioned that it's, SD, it's software-defined networking. We're bringing in the WAN, the LAN, and that, the, the total visibility into that network. Um, and so we're, we're really providing a, an a turnkey solution versus a piece that sits between two other things. And, and I, I think it's important that, that that's also known because it's, it's sort of like this fourth thing that, that spurred off the first three. <laughs> so, Peter, Peter, add one more. So, so, on. I've got a technical so question me, for you to some degree. I'm going to go to the bathroom. You can keep going. Uh, go. So this, this, this question is around the term <laughs> split tunneling. I hear this term quite a bit and in, in as it relates to SD-WAN. So from a technical perspective, what does that really mean? And then what are the challenges in terms of visibility from a security perspective with this split tunneling? Well, you guys make it very visible because you track everything. But, <laughs> um, but split tunneling is the idea of, of traffic shaping over a VPN, right? So the idea of traffic shaping we talked about earlier where you can define how, how traffic flows over your two internet connections. Well, when you're talking about VPNs and security, you want to be able to define what traffic goes over the VPN and what traffic goes over, over the internet. So you're not wasting your VPN overhead. And a lot of SD-WAN providers are now saying you're split tunneling and within Peplink even, you can actually control what, how traffic flows inside the tunnel. So for example, what traffic goes over my cellular is allowed to traverse over cellular and what can go over my ethernet. If, I, if I, we're talking about ethernet with cellular backup, maybe only mission critical data goes over cellular and Netflix is not allowed to waste bandwidth over cellular. So voice and remote desktop security applications, they go over, they can go over ethernet and fail over to cellular. But once, if that ethernet fails, Netflix, YouTube, you know, video, uh, you know, high bandwidth consumption shuts down and only business critical applications are able to continue operating. Okay. It's over the same tunnel. So what that means is there's no interruption. There's no packet loss. There's no drop phone calls. There's no drop remote desktop sessions. There's no dropped EMR sessions because it's seamlessly failing over inside the same tunnel from an ethernet line or an MPLS line over to that backup cellular line. Okay. That's, so tell us about the, uh, the Peplink partner ecosystem. You know, there might be some partners out there watching this broadcast at some point and have decided that, you know, they're going to abandon Silver Peak or, you know, Palo Alto and, and, and move over to Peplink. So what is the sales pitch to those folks? Do it. <laughs> no. uh, <laughs> um, Peplink invests heavily in their partners. I mean, and that's one of the things that we talk about with Peplink being one of the founders of SD-WAN technology in the first place. They're engineers. They're built. They, we don't have a huge marketing budget per se. It's a, it is our it is us. It is the partners. It is the enthusiasts. Um, and so, as a partner of Peplink, what you're getting is you're getting real life. You know, there's no loops and holes and things you have to jump through to get support. You you reach out to your support. You know, you reach out to Peplink and you get support. You get treated well, regardless of if you're a small vendor or you don't have a, a warranty or you don't have an active subscription or you don't have, you know, you can reach out and say, I need help and they're going to help you. So as a partner, you get support. And then even within our own selves, partners support each other. 
I, I've got partners that reach out to me and say, hey, Pete, can you help me with this? I'm having a weird issue. Or, hey, you know, or overseas customers will, will you know, we'll pass each other business and say, hey, I've got a customer that's trying to deploy in Europe and I'm sitting here in, in Florida. Could you help me deploy out in Europe for me? And they'll go deploy in Europe for me. Um, and so we, we all work together uh, because we're not fighting with each other. Uh, so, and even my co-partner, co-partners in uh, America, we, we might, we're competing for the same business, but we, we're all, we all work together. Uh, so, so it's, it's like a partner only company. I, I don't know if I'm, a, I don't know how to answer that one. So they're supposed to be. Does, so let me, okay. So I can't, someone can't just go to Peplink's website and buy a router from Peplink. You're not they supposed to, to buy it to. through a partner. Yeah. Okay. It's like later and every day. And then does Peplink offer like uh, partner marketing materials, those kinds of things? that are necessary they offer some marketing materials but but mostly um uh they they offer marketing like uh like product images and data sheets and that kind of stuff but um you know i, I know that some some vendors will provide like entire like microsite kits uh peplink doesn't really provide that um you know they kind of like i said they're, they're the marketing budget side of peplink is not not there they are working not on there. it but um, the, the, they, they really depend on their partner network, but then they reward the partners a whole lot more. Like I used to be a Cisco and Juniper partner and I feel much more involved in the Peplink world than I ever felt in Cisco and Juniper, um, yeah. even as a really good partner. Um, yeah. and so, yeah. and, and, and like, like, so they, they, they kind of ask you to do a little bit more, but you get a whole lot more in return. And I think sure. Jeremy, one of the things that I've heard from Peter before is, is that, Peplink will listen to you, right? So, Peter, if if you wanted, to, if you ran into a customer and you said, you know, this big German car customer wants me to do X, Y, Z, you just call Peplink and say, hey, this is what they want. They're a bunch of geeks, right? They're going to make the changes for you, pretty much. I, and that that happens. I mean, I had a customer that said, hey, I need to do BGP over GRE tunnels. Peplink didn't support BGP over GRE. Two weeks. Special firmware BGP over GRE tunnels. Is that that crazy one that we're we're seeing? Yeah, we were looking data? at that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so, Peter, quick quick question for you. You talked earlier about the, the healthcare vertical being really strong right now for for Peplink and for you. The next two uh, verticals that you would you know give people guidance in terms of looking at this this uh, SD WAN environment that Peplink brings. Uh, what what would those be? Beyond I'd say emergency responders and um, enterprise branch. The enterprise is 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 looking to to a lot of enterprises are looking to get away from the, that super expensive managed MPLS circuits. And I think that when you take a commodity hundred dollar cable modem and you throw two SIM cards into it, it cost you two hundred bucks a month versus a ten thousand dollar a month MPLS circuit. It, it starts to get very attractive and. Um, I, I've, I'm seeing that more and more coming as the enterprise is getting wise and they're saying, okay, we're not going to, we're not going to do that anymore. It's not required. And, um, and it's really where the growth is right now. And emergency responders as well as, you know, it's not just one SIM card. It's not a cradle point in a, in a back of a, a truck providing some internet connection. They want reliability. They want redundancy. They want to take advantage of FirstNet and Verizon, not just FirstNet or just Verizon. They want to take advantage of them all. Mm -hmm. And so the Peplink bonding technology with our multi-bonding SIMs, it provides that option for them at and a I very cost-effective price. That, that, you know, probably the transportation sector might fall right behind that with all will. the trucking and, and other activity in terms of the tracking, the communications and such. Yep. Cool. Yeah. What is, the, uh, what is the entry point price? And is this something where in our now COVID-19 related uh, world, right, where people are now forced to work from home, may not have VPN, uh, may not have a very uh, tech smart, you know, you know, user base, right? Could you send them a Peplink device that they plug in their, their, their ISP, their, you know, their cable modem or their DSL line so they can access the corporate network? Is that a cost effective strategy? Oh yes, and it starts at it starts as low as one hundred seventy nine dollars. No licensing fees, no user fees. Um, so you, Tornado Alley, like Alice. <laughs> well, then, then you need to buy a BR one, so you you need to be at least at the two ninety nine mark. Um, so for our smallest cellular router. 
Yeah, I'm out in rural America where there's very poor coverage. So, so well, in that case, you know, you go to the HD4, right? Yeah. Um, that way, yeah, exactly. That way you have connectivity regardless. But um, I mean, but the answer, the answer, Jeremy, is yes. I mean, our, our devices are one, our small, small devices can fit in your pocket and they start at $179. And it's exactly for that purpose. It's not cellular. It's a Wi-Fi or Ethernet handoff. So you can use it like at a hotel or Starbucks and it connects to the Wi-Fi network. Then it VPN encrypts that data going back to the corporate network. So they're not connecting to an open Wi-Fi. They're always connecting to a secure device and letting that secure device connect to the open Wi-Fi or the hotel network or the Ethernet. And then in that way, you're not sharing your MAC address. You're not sharing personal information. It's being encrypted and going back to their corporate network. Mm -hmm. um, and then we go to our BR1 our first, our lowest cost entry level cellular router that offers that same functionality would be two ninety nine. So for as little as two ninety nine, you can offer that capability with cellular backup, um, where you have the Wi Fi WAN, the Ethernet WAN, and then the Wi Fi hotspot, and then add cellular connectivity. So this is gonna be a shameless plug for Marriott, but I spend a lot of time in Marriotts. Um, Good Maryland company. Please give me more points. Over <laughs> <laughs> from Marriott's paying attention. Um, but so what you're saying is, I could take, I could for 199 bucks, I could take a device to a Marriott, connect into the Marriott Ethernet or to their Wi-Fi, and have, and then plug my laptop in or whatever device, Wi-Fi or Ethernet, directly into your PepLink device and be on my corporate LAN through secure tunnel. Yes. Yeah, I and think better than and that, I can do better that. than that. Now you want to want to restrict man. this whole Marriott thing, because you know how they some some expensive hotels, uh, especially when you're in big cities, will charge you per device to be connected to the network. Well, this you take the route, you take the Peplink Soho, you connect to the Wi-Fi, one device, you pay the fee, you rebroadcast your own private network, and your entire family or all of your computers can use that hotspot. Um, and now you have you're paying for one connection instead of five or six. All right, so give me the points, but not him. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question for guy? Tim. Since Tim, you've been uh, super quiet, just drinking your water there, working on your diet. You Kettle one. Two part question. Kettle one. First is, what is your role within West Networks? And then what is your elevator pitch to your customers? Oh, good question. My, my role right now is sales manager, and I've been in here for two months now. So the extent of my pitch is a little limited because I have Peter to utilize as well spoken as he is about PepLink. I've been enduring a lot of training. So if you can imagine the last two months of a cram session on learning everything about every PepLink product in addition to basic na basic networking skills because my background wasn't in networking. So I'm, I'm right here right now with just cramming knowledge. So my, my active pitch right now is, is not 100%, but as speaking with Peter, I utilize Peter for everything that I can at the moment. I would, I would support maybe Tim after listening to Peter that you're, you're substantially improving throughput substantially improving reliability, security through the connections, add a dramatic reduction in cost back to the client, not only from a, a acquisition of the hardware, but through the utilization of the existing telcos and, and, and cable providers and such out there. See, Al was the happy mentor on, on, on sales. I was good with the office direction. So. <laughs> COVID-19 is out there right now. We're all working from home. Right. I mean, we got forget Jeremy's dogs. We have we have we've talked to so many people. Everybody's in their their basements, their workout rooms, any, anywhere where their wife is telling them to work from. <laughs> the question really it, it's a good question is now is the time for things like SD-WAN, for mobile connection, for their distributed networks. Right now, it's even. You should be killing it. You should be the richest man on earth. You should be the guy in the front of the Titanic. I'm king of the world, right? But obviously, that's not going to be the case. I mean, what is it? What is the path for companies as they realize that their workers are distributed, right? And when you talk about Jeremy Blue, 
said, hey, you know what, what about the cable modem? What about people using their home network to connect to my infrastructure? Obviously, that's a huge mistake. Right? And that's actually a common mistake too, because a lot of times people will use their home laptop even, and um, and then they're, they're they're doing stuff online. They're maybe got a virus, or they're not paying attention to their their system stability, and then they're just plugging this into their corporate resources and putting it at risk. Um, and and I think that's the one of the biggest. And so one of the things that we've been promoting with our within our environment is give them a go kit. Have the your work laptop connecting to a work router that has your work phone because some of our our devices support PoE. So you have your phone or your your headset, your laptop, and you're creating that work network at home, isolated from Billy Joe who might be streaming Netflix or doing something else on their network and and getting you know potentially infected computers that could put other computers on that network at risk. Um, if they're isolated, they're more secure um, and easier to manage as a corporate policy. Yeah, so, 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 so and, and that's one of the things, right? So we talk about, we really didn't hit it enough, right? But, but what SD-WAN, what West Networks does in general is help a company with a distributed number of employees and sites to treat it like a corporate network, right? I mean, it's a huge change. And, and, and I kind of leave it at this because I'm getting here by another beer. And Jeremy's probably been nursing. He's probably he's drinking his own spit by now on his I, beer. I'm, I'm still on my first one. so That's pretty sad, Al. <laughs> Considering your weight size, you haven't even had a, like a brain cell value. yet. <laughs> um, is that this is, we jokingly say this is the new normal, right? This is, I don't think this is going to end, even if it ends, even if it, a year and a half from now, everybody starts opening up their offices and partying up. We got vaccines and herd immunity. I have a sneaky feeling that some companies will learn to operate in this mode. I mean, I just had a young lady who works for me saying, hey, I, I want to work from Oregon for the next two months. Okay. What's the difference between Oregon and your own house? What, four days of travel? <laughs> right? I mean, you're going to hate your dog more than us after four days of travel in a car, right? But the point is, is that it's normal. This is, this is the way people really should be growing up anyways, right? It reduces pollution. It's better for the environment. It, it makes people happier. To tell you the truth, we knew this a long time ago. The only thing is we never had trust. And you don't have a choice now. If you want to make money, you got to trust that person is going to show up electronically, remotely. So part of what you were saying earlier about that, Chris, is that this ability to trust, right? But you got to verify it. And that's where the technology with Peplink coming into uh, the fluency tool is you're able to verify the activities that individuals now working from home. It's not like the need, NSA. Right? Trust with, but verify. Uh, <laughs> but it is. You got you to verify because even, even today, right, Peter, we showed you that there was a potential connection to. A country that was abnormal that uh, you know caused you to go take a look at that and we got to make sure that together from a security enabled network solution right that we can help companies understand exactly what it is the employees behaviors are doing where they're going what they're doing so that they do adhere to corporate guidelines and practices yeah i think i was going in a different section now i mean since we got Tim, Tim, timmy on board is to put the pressure on and say hey if this is going to be the new norm, you should be able to start selling it right away, right? That Absolutely. If this is a long-term solution for your company, not a short-term solution. I guess that was my whole point is that if we're changing it and now, and, and, and I see this as one third the pie, right? We, the one, uh, a third is my current infrastructure. The second is my ability to, to work with my employees remotely. And the last is my, to work with web services, right? And, and right now, everything is so distributed that you have to be able to work with all of them. And what I found with Peplink is, is that by split tunnel and giving his vision on both sides of the tunnel and get the data and stuff like that. But this is, this is the new, not only the new norm, right? The companies that adapt to this now, right? They're not only going to protect themselves in the first three to four months of this COVID crap, right? They're they're starting the path of where they should be a year and two years from now, right? 
I mean, it makes sense. I mean, if we got drones flying crap from left to right, why are we making people drive into an office if they don't talk to their fellow employees? That's so, right. No, you're ensuring continuity in the future. Uh, you're ensuring scalability and continuity is what you're doing. I mean, by investing in technology like, like this, you're, you're ensuring the capability um, and, and of, your, of your staff. Yeah. Yep. We didn't talk about this earlier, but uh, software defined networking. Do you offer a, a OVA or a, a virtual machine, a virtual appliance? We, we have a virtual, yeah, we have a virtual fusion hub. It's designed to like allow you to have, for example, I'm, um, I bond into Azure. Uh, and so I have a fusion hub in Azure. And then that, that allows me to make my multiple WANs connected to a Microsoft platform. It gives me access to my Azure virtual environment, my Office 365, but then go out to the internet on a reliable uh, platform. Um, and coming soon. Am I able to stick, am I able to stick this in front of, Amazon, you know, AWS, GCP, Google, your own Hyper-V, VMware. be the front end input into my, my virtual cloud? Not yet. If you can see me. <laughs> One of our favorite things is, is there's where's Waldo? There's like, where's Peter? And, and when, before this whole COVID crap kicked in, like we were doing our GOIP stuff at our interfaces. And <laughs> We can track Peter from his mobile IPv6 address. Where is that address today? They just follow him around the universe. It was the, it was the one most wonderful thing because you get Peter logging in and, and he didn't know that his phone wanted to talk to, to Office 365, but Office 365 would say, you know what? Peter's in Houston today. Peter's in New York today. And we knew a day Peter wasn't going to make a meeting because Peter was somewhere else. But the point is, is that it, it's a, it's a great combination, right? I mean, you know, Al hit it earlier on. I, I think it's it's misunderstood is that these devices give their own GOIP, right? And between that GOIP and the GOIP from the web services like Zoom and Office 365, and then the facility information, you really actually have a good understanding where people are. And you can do behavioral analysis and say, that person can't be those two places. Yeah. Right. But you know, I, 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 I'm going to be here for too many hours and I'm already getting low on my second beer, Mr. I drink slowly, Jeremy. Um, I'm and, done. Uh, you know, I think it was I'm done to too. They're good. good. I think we're at the, we're at the top of the hour. Good. And so I guess what I was kind of wrapping up is, is twofold. One, I really wanted this meeting to occur way before we had this chance, Peter, because I think that this technology is a very relevant technology today that's completely misunderstood. And in the security industry, listen, there's a huge amount of pushback from the major SIM vendors and the major MSSPs about what you're doing because they don't like it because they're not used to it. They want all their employees to be in facilities. They want to get their data via syslog local and local broadcast, right? They don't get service information. They don't get SD-WAN information. It's, it, and it's not normal, right? And, and now it's all broken and they have nobody but themselves to blame, right? So I really want to get you online because not only do you have a very sexy three-dimensional printer, right? Which which you're going to have to do another broadcast where we just sit around and watch it while we drink beers. <laughs> and I guess we have to wait till when, when is your drinking? You're not allowed to drink. Over May 28th. Okay. Oh, my birthday. My you 40th go. birthday. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. So. Still a youngster. Yeah. I was going to say, lucky <laughs> fucking a kid. All right. So that's good. So, so my point is, is that we, we do have to have a conversation because there's, there's a lot going on with West Network than just SD WAN. Right. But I think that, that SD WAN is just mobile technology and routers and distributed networks in general is it is a part of our industry that just absolutely and I mean my industry as far as security industry and Jeremy's industry, it we suck at it, right? Because we want everything to be a LAN. And and I do think that the Peplink guys, listen, they're awesome, they're very geekish, they give us hardcore, they're more OS oriented, you know, not to the kernel kind of people 
than they are at this touchy feely stuff. But you know, I'm 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 awesome, you know, happy about it. But um, you know, I think kind of wrapping up in my brain is is that I do think that there is a huge message about what you're doing right now. And I think it's important. I mean, I don't know, Jeremy. I mean, can you think of customers right off the bat? I think of customers right off the bat that we need to have a discussion with Teplink. Oh yeah. We can walk this into half a dozen places tomorrow if yeah. we were resellers. And I think, you know, the, and, the way- Or you just partner with West. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, in one way to really say this is the future is now, and those who take advantage of that now will be better off from a, a competitive scenario in, in the near term future. Yeah. Listen, I could buy, uh, this has to be hmm? this this has to be part of every company's resiliency strategy going forward. No longer can you assume you'll always be able to be in a common place. You need right. to have distributed people and support and I, that in a secure way. I think that businesses have to realize that, you know, it's a competition. We're all competing against each other, right? Businesses are competing. And, and the reality is, is that there's uncertainty right now with COVID. There's uncertainty on sales, uncertainty on dealing. But the reality is, is that if you can make your decisions clearly and act fast and quickly, you're going to beat your competitors. And, and, and this network is not going to change. The SD WAN network existed before COVID-19. And now it's going to exist after COVID-19. You had, I, I think it's a clear understanding that that putting your, you know, putting yourself on this side of the curve is going to position your company a lot stronger then if you're going to sit there and say, it's all going to go back to normal because it's just not going to go. But you know what? Forget social wise, technology wise. It's not going to go back to normal. I don't see it. That's true. So on every episode, you accused me of going back in time. So I'm going to do that right now. So Peter, back in the day, 1995 with IBM's OS2 product on their. OS2 Warp. Um, that OS2 warp server. That's when Al had hair that was a different color than silver. <laughs> we we were able to put multiple token ring cards and multiple Ethernet cards and make a software defined NIC, if you will, that could go in and defy you know in and out type of routine. So we were doing that back in '95, and it's amazing to see that technology come forward. And Absolutely, everything matures. Back, back in 1995. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say the most important question that we haven't asked yet is, Tim, are you related to Patrick in any way? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> there you go. No, I'm, oh. I'm not. But I can definitely, as many times as I've been asked in my lifetime, I can say it with a straight face and lead someone on for, for hours. Really Mine's do. Adam West. So... <laughs> Yeah. So you were going to say in 95, Peter, you were doing what? So in 1995, I built my very first ever router um, by hand. Um, my my dad and my brother and myself, it was dial-up internet, obviously, most, mostly back then, especially at home. And uh, I, I was the young, youngest and I wanted internet. So I took my 46 DX4100 PC. I installed Windows NT server, enabled routing uh, services on it, and then I installed a a, uh, a modem and a four, uh, three network cards. And I ran, yeah, I didn't know what cat five was or, you know, network cabling was. So I just ran electrical cable between my computer and my dad's computer, crimped it, terminated it, and plugged it. Oh. In. <laughs> uh, and, um, but I made my own network, uh, between my, between my dad and my brother and myself, and then used my computer to dial the internet and share that with, uh, with my dad and my brother. So we can all be on the internet with dial up internet at the exact same time. Uh, and it's sort of how, what brought me into network, but it's funny cause you brought up 1995 and actually that's when I built my first ever network and router. And I had my own color code for the cat five cables and well, the electrical cable and, you know, I had the mapping all set up and, um, and so that I, you know, my dad just, I was the funniest thing. I had this whole document on the wall that shows, you know, this, these are the different colors and how you, the pin organization of them. And so, <laughs> you know, 95 is Al's favorite year. That's the year he joined ARC. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I do have a That's when Al retired. 
right. I was like, I remember when they created punch cards. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I actually worked on punch card machines back in the day. In the, in the Listen, I, my old time cards at Telenine Brown used to be on punch cards. Trust me. And then, uh, to reinforce right, well, that fact, I still have a stack of punch cards. <laughs> wow. That's impressive that you could just pull yeah, that right there. I mean, like he has his whole desk of all this stuff and he has a stack of punch cards that he can pull out. That's man, that, they were <laughs> fantastic for taking for notes that. on. <laughs> right out of the enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Listen, really, really appreciate the time here this evening. And uh, I I'm excited because I do think, Peter, that, that what you are doing here is something that is incredibly valuable, not only from a technology leadership perspective, but I think as a veteran, right, for our country to, to poise us to a position of strength from a technology perspective in the marketplace so that we're not lagging, we're leading once again. Thank you. Thank you for having me on here, too. So, Chris and Jeremy, any final thoughts? Or? Hmm? Any final thoughts? No, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. My okay. ears are done. And my water's freaking done. That's how done I am. I was like, I was in an hour before this drinking water. <laughs> floating. I'm good. I'm done. Just all, right, all, right, all right. Jeremy? Jeremy? All good. Gentlemen, it was great to, uh, to talk to you today. Thank you very much for coming on. We appreciate right, it. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Peter, Tim, thank you so much. All right. Have a great right. day. Bye-bye. Have a good one. All right. All right, we're done. <laughs>